Welcome everyone to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast. I'm a networking expert and the author of the upcoming book, No, No Strangers, How to Build Community, One Relationship at a Time. My why is the pursuit of mastery, and the goal of this podcast is to lock arms on a lifelong mission of daily personal growth to become the best version of ourselves. So let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. We are joined by special guests. We have the Canadian rock duo, The Standstills. So welcome to the podcast, Johnny Fox and Rene Couture. How are you guys? And what's life like in Oshawa on this glorious Saturday afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's raining. <laughs> yes. But uh, it's nice to actually see rain instead of snow. So spring is in the air. Yeah. The- the snow, great. yeah, the snow will be gone very soon. It's <laughs> pretty awesome. And unless you love snow, I, you know, I, I, when it comes to winters, I like snowboarding. I like hockey and that's about it. So I don't know if you guys are yeah. different and you love the snow and you love the cold. There's benefits to winter for sure. Um, I played hockey most of my life. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's just part of being Canadian, you know, but uh yeah, I love love the cold, but looking forward to the summer. <laughs> what uh, what position did you play? Were you the enforcer? Was the penalty box your best friend? Uh, I was center and right wing, but okay. uh, but yeah, I, I well, I was I was kind of a, the playmaker enforcer, <laughs> which was so, which so was, the enforcer with a little bit of skill, essentially. Yeah, like I, I can score goals, <laughs> but and like make plays and pass and stuff and and uh, I, like, uh, uh, but you know it's I, <laughs> I haven't played hockey for a little while, but uh, um, I think I, maybe I was more like a uh, Mario Mario Lemieux. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a, hey, if you could strive to be a, a hockey player, that's a good one. What? Let's mm. see, let's see your your mug there. For everyone to see. Here it is. Screw this. I'm going back to bed. So uh, yeah. we, we talked before we recorded that you're more of a night person. Mm-hmm. What is it about the nights that you like? I, I know as a musician, normally, you know, you're up late because you're on tour, you're performing. But for you, just naturally, it's it's the nighttime feels better. It's peaceful. You know, when uh, when it's late at night and it's just very calm and still and quiet. And I, I don't know. I just, uh, I enjoy that. I enjoy stargazing, you know, like if the, if the night sky is out, I think it's a beautiful thing to see, but you know, it's just uh teach their own, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'd like to share with our, with our listeners, how we ended up here today. So uh, back on, on episode number 32 of the podcast, I had, Chuck Daly from My Mother Earth. And Mm -hmm. when when we were doing the episode, he mentioned that he was playing bass on your new album and he introduced me to the band. I went and checked out everything and he said, you got to get these guys on. But there's a caveat. If you're interviewing them, you need both of them because they have good chemistry together. It's not the same if there's (laughs) only one. And he also said when he thinks of you guys, he thinks hashtag relationship goals. So that's pretty, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. He's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Chuck's yeah, awesome. He, uh, we spent a lot of time with him. Oh, there's our, there's our third. I don't know if you heard him monkey, our cat in the background, but uh, if you're, luck, an appearance. If, if you're lucky, will. you'll get all three of us. <laughs> <laughs> we can only we can only hope. So I I've actually enlisted some Canadian rock royalty to help me describe your band sound. So are you guys ready for this? I got a little surprise for you. Yeah, let's oh, do it. This is fun. So this is from Christian Tana, the drummer from I Mother Earth. So he says he start. Oh, oh, there he is. Spotlight on the cat. The oh, cat. hang on, hang on, hang on. Go Sorry, ahead. hang on. Come here, buddy. Yeah, this is live, right? That's all good. <laughs> we got to get the cat in there. 
See, I have a rabbit that's right beside me actually watching as well. So he was very vocal. So I think he wanted to join us. That's all good. That's all good. He wants to hear the quote. So this is from Christian Tana. He says, they're just my favorite people in rock. We've been friends since we toured together back in about 2016. They're a great band, better people, and they work hard, which is uh, what I appreciate a lot. The fact that awesome riff master Johnny is sexy as F-bomb doesn't hurt. But then he says, but I know that my buddy Renee is the real brains behind the operation. And here's where he helps me describe the sound of the band. He says, eagles, deserts, whiskey, guns, murder, way cool. Me and my band love those fuckers. Christian Tana, how does it feel to get some, <laughs> some kind words from the drummer from my mother earth? That's unreal. I love that. That's, that's, the, that's awesome. the nicest thing anybody has ever said about us. That's, that's our new bio, I think. <laughs> it should be our bio, yeah. for sure. I love yeah. that. I what thought that was a pretty guy. cool description, which is uh, which is awesome. So you guys are you guys are obviously huge music lovers. Where does this love of music come from? Like when you think back to growing up, what what are the earliest musical memories where music seems to have kind of taken a hold of you? Well, I think for me, it would have stemmed from my parents because my parents are very much into rock and roll and bringing their kids to concerts. So um, my earliest memories are concerts as a kid. So. I think that's where it stemmed for me. Uh, I guess I, I fell in love with it um, at a young age, listening to my dad's vinyl. Like he had uh, some seven inches that I like, uh, uh, guess who seven inch that had uh, like it was a it was two tracks like these eyes and American woman classic and i was just like that that to me was just something that was i just i was hooked it was it was just there was such an energy coming out of the speakers and it just made i was so young i was just like dancing around to it all the time was it on the like the fisher price record player you remember that thing oh yeah, Did you have yeah. One of those? i had i had one of those like plastic yeah you yeah. know like the orange and white plastic record players but uh I don't know, like my, my, my family was always, it just seemed like any time music was on was a time to celebrate. And that to me was the greatest moments of my childhood because it was, it was always memories of happy times and people just enjoying the moment. And to me, that was, that was a re that I was hooked then to just want to, do that for, and celebrate with other people you know like that I, I think maybe that was my addiction to music was just the um the social celebration <laughs> and and from there how do you how do you gravitate towards your respective instruments so the drums or the guitar uh well for me like again going to concerts um for some reason I was I was just always fixated on the drummer like I just I don't know what it, the energy or what it was, but um, early in school, I was really fortunate enough to go to a school that had a program um, where the music teacher was just so engaging with her students. And um, even at an early age, I think it was grade four, maybe she would go around the room and show everybody and let everyone try every instrument. And so everybody was introduced to everything. And whatever you gravitated towards the most is where she put you in the class as concert band. And so she, you know, introduced me to drums and then I got involved in that. And she kept that going right up until grade eight. And then I continued it through high school and stuff. So really lucky to have a teacher like that. And um, that's what got me into drums. I, I don't think I got a drum kit until I was about 12. But um, that was when my parents kind of got involved because, you know, for them, which is great, too, because, you know, drumming is one of those things that you just can't do quietly. Right. And at the time when I was doing it too, electronic drum kits weren't on the scene yet. I was going to so. say even electronic kits are like they're noisy enough too. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for them to nourish that, too, and um, get a drum kit for me and, you know go through all of, all of those great playing over the years <laughs> was that the greatest gift you ever received as a kid was the drum oh kit? yeah and it's funny because when I went to go get pick up the drum kit we went there for a very specific kit um 
But when we got there, there was already one set up and I swear it had all the lights on it and it was silver sparkle, and I, but it wasn't the one we were there for. But I remember seeing it and being like, oh, that's a nice drum kit. And that's actually the one we went home with, so. That's nice. Yeah. Johnny, how do you gravitate towards the guitar? Um, it's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, I guess um, gravitating towards it uh, was the vibration of it. You know, like I, 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 when I was younger, I used to like to pluck the strings and feel the vibration and just like pluck a string and hold it. And just like, I loved that feeling. Like, I don't know, it was just like a- You're like the, the Beethoven of guitar with like the, the ear to the, the instrument. The buzz of it is just like, I, it's fa it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, your parents are <laughs> but, both very uh, musical too, right? So Yeah, so I I mean, that's, that's I had the opportunity to to do that. But I mean, when you're, when you're younger, the, and you don't, for, for, for my generation, you didn't have phones and all that stuff. So you would find ways to entertain yourself. And that's always a, like a lot of curiosity about a lot of different things. And the guitar was just one of them that I felt like it was just something incredible, something magical. So the, the, uh, I gra gravitated towards it because of the, the joy I saw it bringing other people when my parents would play it. And, uh, and just the, the vibration of it, I thought was just so, um, I was hooked to it. It was like, it, it was, I don't know, just me wanting to, I guess it's the, uh, me just wanting to, to uh, pursue something that's, that seemed like this magical instrument, <laughs> magical tool of celebration. So I gravitated towards it. <laughs> And, and how early on did you guys know you had something special and that music was something you wanted to pursue full time as a career, possibly? Uh, solo wise, like before we were a band? Just period where you, you thought this could be a career. Like, I, I feel like I have some talent. I feel like I have something to offer. I feel like people could appreciate what I do. And, and you know, maybe if I dedicated myself to this, that this is actually a career choice. I think for us, it was more organically we, like we, we just did it because we love to do it. Like we were just such huge fans of music and that's what really brought us together. We would go to shows um, and have a blast. And then we just started playing together because it was fun and we didn't think about making it a career. You know, like I think that if, when you, if you, if you're setting out to make it a career, maybe your focus is in the wrong place. And so we just did it because we love to do it and we were very creative people. And then when it became a career is when record labels wanted to sign us. And then we just, we pursued, <laughs> we pursued that um, instead of pursuing the jobs that we had at the time, but um, you know, like, I, I think that's more importantly than setting it to make it a career is just doing what you love to do. And mm -hmm. I think that if you do what you love to do, then, you know, things will happen. And we're very fortunate to be able to do what we love to do and, and have the people have people love what we love to make. And I think that the, that's, that's probably <laughs> like, I mean, that's how it happened for us. So. <laughs> Um, I'm never, I'm never, I'm, I'm never too interested in, in bands that like, are, that's their main goal because usually the music that they make is pretty shitty or pretty like obvious. And I don't want to make obvious music. Like too try hard. Yeah. I want to make shit that's, that's organic and real and coming from an honest place. I mean, kind of going off a lot, but more on the side of when did you kind of realize that you might be able to do this for a living? I think for us too, it was our first rehearsal, like our, I wouldn't even call it a rehearsal. We weren't rehearsing for anything. <laughs> we, just we were just jamming. We were just jamming and we were both in a music program. And at the time uh, it was just in like his basement and we hit record on our very first ever interaction of us um, playing together. And 
listening back to that recording, it was, you know, one microphone mono, um, but we would show people and it was the reactions of other people and how much they liked it, that that was kind of like, oh, other people like this too. So I, think I knew, I knew other people were going to like that. <laughs> I just knew because because Renee's, based on Renee's such a, a like fucking great Robert drummer. Gordon, so right? I just <laughs> well, no one knew that. <laughs> Did you guys meet in that program, or you knew each other before that? No, we met in the program. So yeah. the program is London, Ontario. Was that the fan shot, the music industry arts? It was, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a, I have a, another surprise for you. Can you handle two surprises in one day? All right, let's do it. Okay, so here's a surprise for you. So. I happened to uh, go to school in London as well. So this is in 2004. I moved from Ottawa to London, Ontario to take a similar program, but in a private college called OER, Ontario Institute of Audio Recording Technology. So I took audio engineering. And in my program, we had a very special guest that came in to talk to the class. His name was Dan Broadbeck. So... I have a quote here from Dan Broadbeck, who was your teacher <laughs> at, at Fanshawe, and uh, he went on to work on two of your albums, I believe. So here's the quote. This is from Dan Broadbeck. There's not a bad thing to say about Johnny and Renee. They're a great band and even better people. I taught them in my first year teaching. You were there on the ground level. That's awesome. Uh, which is how we met. And then I produced their first album and mixed the second album. So that's Dan Broadbeck, Juno, Juno award-winning producer. He's worked with the salads, with Dolores from the Cranberries and with the standstills. So that's from Dan for you guys. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Awesome. He's such a sweet guy. And he's like so incredibly talented. He's, yeah. His ear it, like for music is is unreal when we worked with him he, he was just like it, it was amazing the magic he could do with uh engineering and mixing and stuff it's just great producer too yeah. and grammy nominated too right grammy nominated last, so i guess they focus for what sorry i think it was last year or the year before oh, last year he had okay the, the dolores dolores's song? solo album From last solo album Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, I guess when they hype up someone, they focus more on the win. So they just say Juno award winner instead of a Grammy, <laughs> a Grammy nominee. I mean, that's huge. That's maybe yeah. bigger than a, than a Juno win, but, uh, any, so. anyway, so he worked on the first two albums with you guys. I'm curious, the first two albums aren't up on any streaming sites. Is that a conscious choice that they're not there? Uh, well, once we, we had our label and we had our record deal, um, once we released the first EP, um, we kind of decided together that we should drop the back catalog. It was like a fresh start. Yeah. And we sense. wanted to we wanted to come out as as something different because we had progressed. And uh, and then we also like we love when bands also have a, sort of a back catalog that is released later. So our pursuit when we when we started with the label is we were starting as something different sort of fresh um and we eventually will <laughs> release the back catalog stuff um to show a little bit more of the story but uh, well that being said it is up online but it's kind of hidden within our website for our fan club members so um, mm -hmm. people who join our mailing list have access to it, but only them. I, I saw there was a members only fan club area and I was, I was curious what the perks were. And now I, now I know if I want to hear the first two albums, I know what to do. Yeah. That's where it's, that's where it's at. Yeah. And a lot of it is live off the floor. Oh, one of them <laughs> is exactly live off the floor. Yeah, we the didn't whole... even, yeah. We didn't even see each other. So yeah, it was that an was interesting, crazy. interesting recording. <laughs> like but, I can feel you. Yeah, yeah. We had a we we went to this like cottage out, up north in Canada, and it was supposed to be the studio, like really nice studio. We got in there, and it was uh, when we were getting ready to record. It was just somebody's. It was like a house, and uh, what's happening? <laughs> Man, you're getting like a trying, beard beard trying, combing. I know he he likes to he likes to he likes to. Um, reciprocate the petting and try to like <laughs> pet me back that's but, uh that's a well that's a well-trained cat i like it he's a very he's a very loved cat mm. 
but uh, he, uh, so we, uh, we went up there and that, but it was like the hottest day of the summer. So when we went to hit record, you could hear the AC in the room because it wasn't properly like set up. So we, we, we had to kill the AC and we basically were just like, roasted yeah we roasted, roasted we were the braised whole, yeah and we recorded an album when we were being like in when we were in an oven <laughs> and that album's called the human element <laughs> there you, there you, we get the backstories so yeah. you, you guys start jamming as a duo just organically did you just decide to keep it as a duo? I mean, normally you have a, a drummer and a guitarist and you start jamming and then, you know, obviously you add a bass player and you fill it out, maybe another guitar, maybe keys. And there's very few bands. I mean, you got your white stripes, your um, death from above your uh, oh, what's there's a huge duo band right now. Trouble's coming. What's the name of that band? Anyways, oh, Royal, Royal Blood. Blood royal blood uh so did you guys just say hey this is something unique i like the way it sounds just the two of us or it just that's just the way it is you never added someone else honestly it's because bass players just weren't working out we we <laughs> tried we tried out a few and then um i think we just because we were also in a relationship too we were just reliable on each other like we knew we were going to be there for practice we knew you know we were committed but mm -hmm. to get other people committed and like, yeah, and, and always obviously the chemistry too, right? The chemistry has to be right. And we just never found it when we started out. So we just kind of continued as a two piece because that was what was reliable and was working really well for us. So. Yeah. I think that like when we, when we tried out bass players, it was a lot later when we first sort of started, like we started as a two piece and because we just wanted to play and, so we never really, you know, we never, we never considered us any different than that because when we were playing as a two piece, that's just, that was just us. That's just what we wanted to do. And, uh, and the, so we never even really thought about um, bass until later down the road because we were just enjoying the moment. And I guess they, they, I think that that's, probably the best thing that you can do if you're going to create art is enjoy the moment he's <laughs> actually cutting you and, and, and try to uh is, is he bleeding or is he going to survive this uh... he's got like two giants no, he's not cutting me yeah. i mean we, we do have to... we might we might end up he with never... just renee by the end of this interview he would never dig into me like that he's just being a good boy <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so the, the the band name the standstills does where does that come from is it just that it sounds cool or is there a meaning behind that uh well we we we've tried to change it actually but um the label said no <laughs> yeah no like you know what when we when we were starting out like we we were just having a lot of fun and and renee came up with the name she's like you know what if it's like kind of like a western standoff we call it something like the standstills we're like, yeah, that kind of rolls off the tongue. Let's let's go with it. Let's have some fun. And that that was basically it. You, we never put too much thought into it. We just we loved it at the time. So we just stuck with it. And then I mean, we got a record deal and now we're the standstills. So that's kind of it. I, I think, you know, like you don't it's the band that really makes the name. So it, that's always been a, a thing, the music that really defines the, what the name is. But we, we kind of looked at it over the years as something very kind of like moments caught in time and like when, when life seems to just stand still and like you're, you're enjoying the moment and stuff. And that's kind of what, is, what it means to us now. And I think that's what a really incredible song does. It kind of just slows time down and really makes everything just that much more incredible. And uh, I think that that's kind of what the name means to us. And our pursuit has always just been like, we just want to write really creative, amazing music and amazing songs that mean something that can make the, the, the world stand still for a minute, <laughs> you know, and enjoy the moment. So that's, I think that's what it's kind of ended up being. But at the time, yeah, it was just like, we were just having fun and it sounded good. 
See, when I when I think of bands that, you know, just kind of randomly name themselves and then regretted the name later, you think of ridiculous names like Red Hot Chili Peppers or Rainbow Butt Monkeys or Butthole Surfers. The Standstills <laughs> is an awesome name. So I, I don't <laughs> know. Why do you I, like it? I don't Thank know. You. Why, I don't know why you guys think of changing it. But uh, anyways, it's you, got a stick it, now because of the success you've had already. So. Yeah, Thank you. you know, what I really did it. It was because we went on tour with a band called The Lazies. And someone brought it to our attention that it sounded like the worst tour ever, like <laughs> yeah. the standstills and the lazy. You should add, like, you should add, do you guys win- do anything? Yeah. My favorite band is, is winter sleep. So you should add them to your oh, yeah. as well. And it's yeah. just a bunch, a bunch of people put some couches on stage and you just lie there. I'd, yeah. I'd buy a ticket. Uh, who, who, who would you say are the band's biggest musical influences? So when I listen, I've listened to your discography many, many, many times. Um, Thank you. There's certain, you know, bands that jump out and influences. So I have an idea, but for our listeners, how would you describe maybe the sound and and who are the influences from the start? Uh, Well, I think the sound Christian Tama, (laughs) (laughs) but uh, like we, when we first started, we were huge into John Spencer blues explosion. We loved underground stuff. It was just dirty, raw, like it's almost like when you hear the recordings that the people, it, it was so, it wasn't so perfect at all. It was so loose and so freeing and, and uh, that stuff was really exciting. And then over time, I think that, you know, like we got really into a lot of desert rock, um, uh, so like Caius heavier, and Queens, yeah, and and... Queens is all that stuff. And but we we also really I like loved like some polished sounds too. You know, like it's there's there's um, a way of doing that and still maintaining um, a, a certain vibe about it that is still seems rich and cool. You know, like think that when you when you, there's a fine line when you get too polished, it's like cheesy and just terrible. But if you kind of hold it uh, at a certain level, it's just really good sounding, and you're bringing to light a lot of amazing things in the recordings. Um, so, like I, I think that Royal Blood does that really well. You know, like but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was more influenced by the radio, to be honest. Like, I, everything that was played on the radio was the songs I would go home and practice to or try out to. And I like Canadian rock radio, um, especially like when we first got together, it would be about, you know, we had doubles of CDs now because we had yeah. so many bands in common that we were listening to. And a lot of that was Canadian rock. But um, I, it's so weird because we our influences are pretty split, but there are a lot of commonalities. And especially like when you're together for a long period of time, like you start to, it becomes a melting pot, right? Like I was never really into the grunge scene, like heavily, but he was. I was obsessed. And, uh, yeah. And now I love it, right? Like I, I'm like, how did I not hear about these records? You know, I knew the singles because of radio, but yeah. I never dove into it. It was the like records. Incubus for me. Yeah, and like, I love Incubus, so but he Inc- didn't really know them. And yeah, I knew Mr. Bungle yeah. and like <laughs> and Primus. He introduced and like me Faith to Primus. No More, and I was like, and I knew Incubus, but not the catalog. So when we when we met and I started to listen to the catalog more, like then they're great, I fell in they're great musicians. I saw them a couple times in Toronto and. Man, those musicians can they can play their instruments in uh, Incubus. Oh, great albums! Yeah. yeah, yeah, science like where they're jamming and that's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're a bit of, we're a bit of a melting pot, I'd say. But I think that's the beauty of it. You know, we're not the same person. <laughs> that's, that's probably for the best. You you mentioned Can Rock. I actually have a, a question sent in from a fan that has to do with can rock. So this is a good segue. So they say I was at a standstills slash I mother earth concert. And while I am, was playing, Renee was rocking out and singing along to every tune was can rock a big influence on them growing up. And then he says, keep me anonymous because I have a crush on Renee and you're interviewing her husband, LOL. So (laughs) I was Christian too, wasn't yeah, it? Was it? That wasn't, that is, that is not, I can tell you that was not Christian. No, I funny. know. <laughs> so yeah, definitely, definitely had an influence on me. 
I think it, like when we when growing up in Canada too, like at the time when radio was so huge, you know, like the the bands that we really had in common, like Big Rack, Tea Party, like that stuff was you you never knew it was Canadian. You just assumed it was worldwide. OLP, and, Travel Charger. I mean, yeah, like, Nickelback. If you have a guilty pleasure, like me, but I do. Well, I do a have a guilty pleasure. Me, but, yeah. I know people might hate me for that, but <clears throat> they got some massive songs. People only started hating them because they got huge. And I, you yeah, know, you like, know, you've made it when you start to get like legit global haters, right? Yeah, but uh, there was there was amazing stuff. Um, Daglo abortions. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Gandharvas. Gandharvas yeah. from London, That's Ontario. But there's uh, so many. I could miss so many, but yeah, all the edge fests and yeah. yeah. When you think about how badass the industry is, too, like you, you have a lot of really cutting edge hard rock bands coming out of Canada. Um, Alexis on Fire. Those guys are they they rip like death from above like that stuff is it's it's really really good music so i i mean the guilty pleasure of can con is i think just the guilty pleasure of liking good music <laughs> you know yeah I, i've seen i've seen your your sound described as something like the queens of the stone age if they were body slammed by the white stripe something like that so i'm wondering johnny would you say that jack white and josh home are like your guitar heroes or you're you just enjoy I, the music I, I so uh, I get a lot of comparisons with Jack White, but to be honest, like I, I enjoy his guitar playing, but he was never my big influence. Like uh, I liked more Tom Morello stuff and the way that he was using pitch shifters and stuff and the heaviness in the guitar. I love um, um, Hill Country Blues, and I think that Jack White also like he loves hill country blues but i was like i was listening to rl burnside i love the album of john spencer blues explosion and rl burnside ass pocket of whiskey like i was into that stuff way earlier than knowing the white stripe stuff but i i have a, a very deep appreciation for what jack does as well and uh as far as josh like i just love what he the um, way that he extends riffs into a certain hypnotic pocket. And I think that that comes from a lot of my uh, enjoyment of listening to Hill Country Blues. You know, like there's there's um, a way of just enjoying, I guess it's just enjoying the moment again, like that, you know, there's a lot of music that's very progressive or it goes from one thing to the next to the next. It's very fast. But sometimes when you just hit a pocket and you can just, groove to it like that to me is something very special you know and you you don't have to be sometimes the progressive stuff gives me anxiety <laughs> like i'm just like why does it need to change so quickly all the time and just like i just want to like bob my head or like move to it or dance to it and i think that josh was probably like a massive influence in in for me in that sense of the stoner rock stuff and uh, you get to really feel the guitar breathe on notes, you know, like, and it's just that you, it's like um, every single time you're hitting the strings in that same pattern, the guitar is vibrating differently. The, 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 um, the overdrive is vibrating differently. The app, the amp is acting differently. And all of that stuff is happening constantly in those grooves. And I love that. I love the way that you it feels different, like almost every time you hear it, because it's not just one perfect thing over and over and over. It's this character over and over and over, but just shown different ways, the way different ways it's vibrating. I don't know. I'm getting deep into it now. What was, <laughs> that, it? What was the question? <laughs> it, the the in, the sound, the influence of the White Stripes and Queens of the Stone Age. See, this is why we're doing a two hour deep dive. So we we have time yeah. for this stuff, which is this is what people want to hear. You know, if you do a 10 minute interview, mm -hmm. it's like, tell us about the new single. All right. And, that, mm -hmm. and that's it. Right. So. So no, this is the stuff that I enjoy. Uh, I guess you get some of the White Stripes comparisons because they're a duo, you're a duo. There's like, you know, the, <laughs> the, the female drummer. Um, 
some of the guitar sounds on some of your solos have kind of an icky thump type type of vibe, which is awesome. Like if you're going to get mm-hmm. a guitar tone, I mean, that's, yeah. that's one of the best. Uh, I'm curious, we, we've talked about the wild West themes a bit. I'm just curious how you guys got this wild West theme sound look imagery. Uh, are you guys fans of Westerns and, and do you have a favorite Western movie is Clint Eastwood, your hero? He I makes good Clint. movies. Even the non, I, his non-Western or, movies are good. I guess a great director. Should I pull it or vinyl? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a <clears throat> um, Quentin Tarantino. Like we love his, uh, his, like for him is, I, I think his Western style stuff. I, I guess that you, you grab it. Like, everybody like grab Django it. Unchained or... Yeah, yeah the hateful and eight. hateful. We got the hateful eight vinyl, which is like that's why I was gonna I was gonna grab it, but it was like it's this incredible looking vinyl that has like all these blood splatters all over it, and it's just like, but every I guess everybody just gravitates towards what they really enjoy, and that's just what we really enjoy. Like, I, it's, yeah, it stemmed from the soundtracks I think of those movies, right? Like Ennio Morricone is just the most amazing composer. And like that music just lent itself to the themes of the movies, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love Clint Eastwood and I, I love, I love Westerns. So I don't know. I'm trying to think of like where that actually came into the music or like how that happened organically. I don't know. <clears throat> I think it just like, we just, we started um, traveling. <laughs> it's just like, but we started to go to the desert and Palm That's Springs true. and like <laughs> we were just like I don't know we we started to just um it I it happened organically it must so have happened just, just from like yeah just it was probably one winter movies, where we just yeah binge watched all the west the classic westerns talking about it and then just listening to the music diving in and then just like when you I feel like when you love something <clears throat> or when you're influenced by something it it is an organic uh, deep dive into something, you know, like you want to pursue it more. You want to learn more about it. And, uh, Oh, you know what it was? Sorry. Keep going. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> it, it, it would be the, the orchestral stuff in the music because we would in our recordings, we'd be like, Oh, you know what? We need that like rattlesnake thing. Or you know what? I mean? Yeah. <laughs> the vi- the vi- Sorry, I'm just going to grab, I'm going to grab a drink. So no, go ahead. I'll be back. Go on. ahead. But and we would recreate some of those those sounds and those tones in our recordings. It was like, oh, this really needs like that um, the sound of you know like the spurs because there's always like those tambourine hits on snares and stuff sometimes. And we'd be like, oh, we need something that's like kind of spur sounding. And like, I just it became that thing where we were like incorporating all the orchestral stuff into the music. But yeah. and then would the would the image of the band come after? writing and recording that kind of music like you you presented an image that is kind of congruent with the sound of the music i think that was more based on the actual films themselves like i i loved the fashion of wild west and i just i think when we began to incorporate that stuff it was it was already kind of happening in our everyday wear you know what i mean yeah. you got the spurs on your boots johnny i like it Boot tips yeah. for sure. Yeah. I think it we just kind of I guess being part of the music industry, it is kind of the Wild West, you know. And I think we kind of drew a lot of comparisons to that. You know, it's like um uh with the with Wild West movies and stuff, like the characters aren't always what they seem, you know, and you you they slowly progress into something else. And <laughs> it's like the music industry is kind of like that. You know, there's a lot of like uh there's a lot of snakes out there and there's a lot of um and there's a lot of heroes and i think that we we just started to see a lot more of that and so we were drawing a lot of comparisons to that and and i think we just started or, organically bringing that into our music because you know we're we're part of that wild west music industry and uh and i guess that's just the the way that our story is being told <laughs> Like, and we're just kind of bringing that more to light. So I I don't know if you guys are into video games, but if you were a video game, you would be Red Dead Redemption 2. So if you if you don't play, if you don't yeah. know what that is, <laughs> it's one of the greatest games of all time. It's definitely the best Western game of all time. And as I'm listening to your music and watching the music videos, I was like, man, these guys fit right into 
the world of Red Dead Redemption too. So do you do you know what that is or was that just a random? Yeah. We know of it. We don't. That was the nerd. Really that was games, the nerd but... moment that no. you guys might hey, not associate video, with. Video games are fun. Don't, it's not a nerd moment at all. <laughs> like video game, all that shit is fucking, it's fun as hell. Like we, the Red Dead Redemption, I think we have like a PS2 somewhere with that game somewhere i don't know what, yeah it's you probably have years and years one, and yeah. years no, but. we have gun <clears throat> i was playing i got really into gun i don't know if you years know that and one years back yeah i almost beat it but there was a glitch <laughs> we we always blame hours. the glitch when we can't get past hours. A certain area. Yeah. hours no it would actually like it was like a, i don't know if you ever watched king of kong but it was one of those moments where like the screen just kind of would do yeah. one of these you're like what the heck was that yeah we're still trying to to reach the developers <laughs> so if you can put a, put the word out there yeah. about the uh the developers of gun if um, we can accomplish one thing yeah. with this interview it's getting that game fix so that yeah you that's yeah. the only reason why we're, we're we're playing music is we're just trying to reach the developers of gun <laughs> <laughs> and get into space right yeah yeah we we, we really want to do space travel too so elon musk gonna you know, if ever i get if, him as if a guest you're watching yeah. he's putting people up there you know he wants to put us up there that'd be great well, spe- speaking of geniuses, so you guys have an album called Pushing Electric, and you dedicate that to Nikolai Tesla. Um, why that choice? And my question is, we're talking about movies. Have you seen The Prestige, where they oh, feature yeah. Nikola Tesla in it? And uh, it's and it's a great early ne- uh, Christopher Nolan movie. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's a fantastic movie. We, we, we dedicated that album to Nikola Tesla, um because we were at the time we were just um we were really diving into his life and his what he accomplished and everything else and we're like why doesn't more people why don't more people know about this guy like why is it like at the, because at the time this was before tesla cars and and elon musk was huge well and, before our knowledge of <clears throat> tesla as a well, brand yeah, exactly. And so we we just really found it extremely interesting that this genius that created things that that will change history is not brought to light. And we got so deeply into it that we just wanted. Uh, I guess it was just a more I, when we create. It's it's always like we're sponges. We're just sponging in so many different things. And then when we create, we just like let it out and at the time nikola tesla was a huge part of our conversation a huge part of like us like like prestige watching the movie or whatever and and all that stuff so that's just how we were creating at the time and we wanted to dedicate it to him because he was really influencing a lot of ideas and lyrically and stuff and and uh and we think that what he did what he has done for um the the world and still what he's created <clears throat> that has not even brought been brought to light as to the to, to the full capacity is something that um is good for the planet <laughs> you know so we wanted to dedicate that to a really decent human being <laughs> yeah, unfortunately didn't get credit for anything well he yeah. obviously now it's all out on the table and he's finally been pronounced the godfather of a lot of things that he should have been. Yeah. I mean, we, we, all of us that have ovens and microwaves and dishwashers, radios, all that stuff is because of Nikola Tesla. He made that possible. Like, you know, we're, we're able to survive in, in the craziest of climates because of Nikola Tesla. And like, that's, there's the least we could do is dedicate an album to him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're, we're getting the good word out today. Uh, yeah. So in, in 2015, you guys released your EP from the Devil's Porch. Uh, when, when you guys think back to that album, what are kind of the, the emotions, the thoughts, the memories that, that kick in? I mean, that's the album that, that really kicked off the epic journey that you're on now. James Robertson. Yeah, James Robertson. <laughs> uh, the recording process is extremely So that's unique. the producer, right, James? Yeah. Yeah, and engineer. He's a great guy. And, uh, um, so we did it out of his house. Um, he had quite the setup going on um, and we stayed with him for really long periods of time. So he's, he was in Streetsville at the time in Mississauga in this like historical home. And 
I, we just, we spent so much time on that record and working on it together. Mm -hmm. and, and he would come visit us where we were in Oshawa and like listen to his jam, go to our jam space and just kind of sit there and listen. And uh, it was in a, that album was the first time we really worked that deeply with somebody else. Because prior to that, I mean, we we did an album with Dan Broadbeck uh, in the early stages, but it, it it was a pretty quick process because we were we were all busy in our own lives doing things. So Dan was busy, we were busy, so we we kind of we we had a lot of the material. We just went in and recorded, and it was an amazing experience. But for from the Devil's Porch, it was it was we really took our time with it, and. Um, went through uh, a lot of different material and kind of just focused in on certain songs and then going to Streetsville and working with James was an amazing experience. He's a really great guy. He's very creative. He's a genius. And when it comes to a lot of different things and we found it um, um, very gratifying piecing the music together with him in the recording process and uh, there was, it was funny, we, we would go through, because he lived in a house and it was, it was like a historical heritage home. Um, That's why it's called were, Heritage Recording Studio? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he, we, he's not there anymore, unfortunately, but. But there was electrical like issues sometimes. So we would have to change things up. You know, like we would, we'd set the drums up in like a living room somewhere and then it'd be like, oh, we're getting a little bit of crackling. So we'd have to like move things around and stuff. And like, and uh, so it was a, it was a, uh, it was an adventure <laughs> recording in that heritage home. But uh, um, it was an amazing process. And I think that we, when it was all done, we all just kind of sat back and be like, we have something incredibly special here. And uh, and just like looking back at that album now, it's you know that kind of launched everything. This song where leans like it was it was such a fun jam that kind of that brings to light a lot of our John Spencer blues explosion that sort of thing where it's just like I think there's like six lyrics in that song, <laughs> but it doesn't matter because it feels good. And that's important, you know, and we would talk about that, you know, like, do we have to say more? Do we need to add more lyrics? Do we need to do this? It's like, just listen to it. It feels really great. It has a really great pocket. We would have these conversations in Streetsville with James. And uh, I think that's important in the creative process is to really just sit back and let the music and let the art be what it needs to be, not force it. And that's that's from the devil's porch. It's just kind of you know. It's, but also enhancing it with other musicians too. We've never had other musicians come in on the record, mm -hmm. and in that case, we brought in you know Paul Reddick on harmonica mm -hmm. and uh, Anthony Caron on keys. We had uh, from the Arkells. a singer. I know. Yeah. yeah, we had yeah. a singer come in to do female vocals, and like we really put everything into it to really yeah. enhance the songs. So. I think we were really diving into the Wild West theme more. Well, we were in that album more than ever too. So it was kind of like a reflection of where we were at at the time. And that's kind of why we called it From the Devil's Porch. It was just like, um, it was a lot of, there was a lot of blues influence, a lot of Wild West influence. We were just totally diving and saturating ourselves in all of that stuff as much as possible but still maintaining a lot of the edge and the hard rock stuff where we're um we came from like our first time hanging out we were at call the office watching a, a hardcore band bionic <laughs> so we're, we're not this like the wild west acoustic -y thing like we're we're like we're bringing all this edge and heavy and loud stuff to the forefront and using these themes and mixing them all in. And that was, it was a really, really special experience. And we're very grateful for all the people we worked with and mm -hmm. like James helping us um, bring that to light and really piecing that together. Yeah. Mm. Call the office was the go-to place when I was in college. I saw uh, yeah. Powderfinger there. I saw Matt Mays. Uh, 
some amazing bands. I, I, I had friends that saw Queens of the Stone Age at Call the Office when that's how amazing. big the band was. They were that small that they played Call the Office. And uh, I, mm-hmm. I heard that Josh Holm would like run through the crowd with his guitar the whole time just playing, which was pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so you talked a lot about Streetsville. So I actually met Anthony Caron because I was hosting open mics in Streetsville at Marcello's at the Cock and Pheasant. So Anthony wow. Caron came out uh, when he was still in Il Scarlet back in the day. And since then, he's moved on to uh, the Arkells. Um, so you talked about James Robertson working closely with you guys as the producer. Uh, the album was actually mixed by Eric Ratz. Uh, so I reached out to Eric Ratz. So he's a multiple Juno and Grammy award winner. He's worked with Billy Talent, Big Rack, the Arkells as well. And uh, this what this is what Eric Ratz has to say about you guys. He says, I had the pleasure of mixing from the Devil's Porch. I could hear that there was a unique dynamic to their songs and a certain synergy between Johnny and Renee that set them apart from other bands. So that's from Eric Ratz. Is this oh, like a blast amazing. from the past? All these, it is. All these <laughs> it is. See, during it the is. pandemic, it's like we don't see anybody that we know. So it's nice to it's kind true. of still hear from them, right? Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Ratsy's, Thanks for putting that together. Yeah, Ratsy's nice. amazing. He was a he was a really big part of that too. I oh mean, yeah, like the mix. When we came to the table with him, we were just like, "So this is what we have." <laughs> it's like there's like tons of like different things going on in the recordings, and it's just. But I think what Ratsy did is he was just like looking at the the like the simple this like best elements and just like okay it needs to be this 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 it's like let's just use that and push that forward. And that was the first time we were ever present for a mix too. Like he was persistent that we were there, so mm-hmm. like to be able to sit in the room and like hear <clears throat> it in the studio as he's mixing it was pretty. Yeah. unique experience too because working with dan we, we, we would send out the album and stuff because we wanted him to mix it but we so doing that we would have to um we would have to just get the mixes as they were coming in but being close enough to Razi, being able to be there and him really wanting us to be in the room and stuff was was awesome he's he's so good mm-hmm. at uh mixing heavy music <laughs> like it's just his drums are unreal <laughs> like like when he just like dives into the dynamic he, he's like a like Ratsy was a speaker guy right like he used to sell speakers before getting into um mixing and engineering and all that stuff when he was really young so he he recognizes he knows how to push the speakers so when you listen to his mixes like don't listen to him on headphones like this like you got to put them on like a good speaker system and just watch them move that's how he mixes it's it's amazing he's incredible i love that you call him ratsy that's how i know you guys you, you know that you're, <laughs> you actually know each other you have the the, the pet name um are, are you guys good if we dive into the songs on from the devil's porch so kind of touch on the different the different sure. songs on that album so um What's funny is you mentioned that you brought in some other musicians that played. I was going to ask about the harmonica, who's playing the harmonica. You just mentioned that Uh, there were parts where I wasn't sure if it was using guitar with effects or if it was keys, because I didn't know if there was actually keys on the album. So you did mention that there's keys as well. So uh, on the first song, The Road, I guess there's keys in the course. There's some high notes that I weren't I wasn't sure if they were keys or like really fast guitar picking. Mm-hmm. Do you do you remember if there's there's keys on that song? I believe it's Hammond organ. I yeah, think that's what he was we, playing. We made it sound like a guitar. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, that's that's why I was fooled. I was like, yeah. I can't figure this one out. Yeah, I mean, like, there's a it, there. Sometimes just having that separation gives it just a little more depth. Like, if we if to do the guitar stuff, like it when layering those songs and stuff, it throwing in more guitar and stuff, sometimes it just gets a little lost. So when we brought um, um, Tony in to be able to to have that separation from the keys, but we were just like, let's still make it kind of guitar-y. So having it kind of sound like a guitar. So we, we did what we we made it to, uh, what we tried to achieve, which is that we fooled you. <laughs> <laughs> hey fool, fool me once we'll see how many times I, i'm sure i'm fooled many times with these questions no I it's it's it, the songs. no it's <laughs> we were just having fun but it, like it 
it's uh yeah it, tony it was tony and distorted big heavy guitar sound sounding hammond organ up in the up in the higher ranges for sure so the the first single was orleans i got heavy radio play uh, on rock stations in canada featured in a fido commercial that's how you know you've made it oh, and uh I about the commercial yeah and <laughs> So my question, this is for Renee, I, I suppose. Do you think that this was such a big single because you, you were prominently featuring everyone's favorite instrument, the cowbell? Is that what made this a big hit? Let's be honest. Is Will Ferrell a big, so a big fan of this song in this band? I want to know that. I want to know the truth here. Uh, the funny thing is, is that the cowbell came in at the end of the recording. I bought that cowbell in Streetsville. It's true. I never owned one prior. Um, and now it's on everything. Uh, <laughs> we, 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 when we wrote it, it was a horse bell and then we changed it to a cowbell. And What's a now, horse bell? I don't know. It's a stupid joke. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. There's some cowbell on a, on a few of the different songs. I was wondering, man, Johnny, there's like five different badass guitar riffs in that one song. I was curious if you were worried that you were using up the entire EP's worth of riffs on one song and you'd end up just, you know, <laughs> playing chords on the rest of the album. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think like as a guitar Can't you player... share? Can't you share the riffs amongst the rest of the album? No, there's more think... awesome riffs everywhere. I, thanks, man. I think as a guitar player, it's like, when you get into a certain, for me, when I get into a certain pocket, it's just like dancing. It's like you just, you're dancing a certain way and the guitar just writes itself and you just go with it, you know, but uh, that's just what that, that tune just, that's the way it made me feel. <laughs> it's like, I just want to play it like this and, and try to go for it. And, you know? Well, you made the right decision. I would say, uh, you know, with it resonating with so many people, the, the music video has you guys in a hotel room and has Johnny, it's like, you're up late at night. You can't sleep. You're working on a song. Um, how did you, this song actually come to be? Was it, you were saying there's not a lot of lyrics. So I'm assuming the lyrics came second. It was, was it based around a guitar riff? Um, yeah, I think that, uh, looking back, um, I was listening to, um, I was diving into a lot of the old blues stuff and uh, a lot of really uh, early recordings, like I think of Lomax early recordings of like, he would just uh, go around and, and uh, bring a camera to certain parts of the U S and, and just film these like blues players in all these different fields and different places and stuff. And it was just like, I was just so amazed at the energy of these players. Cause these guys are just like, they're playing for, they're playing because they, they love it. They're not playing to make money. They're not playing because of this and that and stuff. And I think that, you know, looking at um, the music, like music industry, you get lost in that. Like you, people forget that this is just like, this is a pastime. This is what people love to do. And it's just, that's it. It doesn't matter if you make money on it. It's because it's, it's, it makes, it makes the life better playing an instrument like that. And it's like, there's a, there, it's like an outlet for so much uh, emotion and, and uh, everything else. And so look, I think that's where the song came from was just the er, looking at a lot of the early um roots of rock and roll probably and a lot of is, fat possum yeah fat record possum stuff, record yeah. stuff um rl burnside and like all that early stuff juke juke joint stuff and like um i think that's why it needed to be simple and not a lot of lyrics because that stuff is just it's repetitive, but people are dancing to it. They're moving to it. And like, that's, that's what that, um, that's all it needs to be. It doesn't need to be more than that. You don't need to force a ton of stuff into it. It's just the simplicity of it is beautiful. And we just wanted to, I think that the, like writing that song, I just wanted to write something that was like that, <laughs> like just keep it simple, straight up, right across the plate. <laughs> like this is how, um, a good song can feel. And I think that just, it was more, 
I, I think that it was more um, a reflection of us being able to um, show that we can restrain ourselves from overdoing stuff. That's that's kind of like the nature of that song. And uh, I think that's the beauty of it. The, uh, the song Shotgun, man, the intro, the guitar and drums, it's such a thick, like, tasty sound I'm, I'm curious how do you how do you get that sound so i guess maybe this is like an instrument kind of question like f- for johnny is there a specific guitar and then amp and then pedals that you use and then renee is there a specific d- drum kit that you you go with or sticks uh, i guess that's what we're getting into for like the the tech heads that are listening to this episode uh well i mean i think the biggest element in that song as far as the drums go was the kick drum um and then on top of that i can't remember if it was rats that did this or it was james but we layered an actual shotgun on the snare drop out of the bridge yeah oh, it, was or was it, cannon? it was rats it was rats it was rats yeah it was it was like a co- like combination of like this like reverb unit and stuff and just the nasty snare like the gun. it was like almost something like um metallica saint anger snare drum like just a touch of it (laughs) but yeah it's i think that was the that one it was uh i remember the kick drum purposely because he took off the front head and then um really tuned it down it was hard to play it because the tighter the head is the quicker your beater can be on it when you're playing the kick drum, but he loosened it so far down that it was like, when I hit it, it just sunk into it. But yeah. that's the sound he was going for. He's like, just, just try and work with me. Like, just, just play it. You can do it. You can do it. And it took me a long time to do it, but we got it done. Mm-hmm. And it was, it's very evident in the song and how it sounds. So, yeah. but to be honest, I think a lot of it is guitar because Johnny does a lot of layering and he works with a lot of really cool pedals and that one specifically was a baritone too oh, that's right like that's I, I really dove into the baritone this that was the first album i think i started using baritone mm-hmm. guitar so it's it's the in between uh guitar and a bass so it sounds like a bass guitar on a lot of it and i think that uh that just made it feel so nasty (laughs) and the the ripping and the just like because now we're just dropping everything right down and just like bringing this like heaviness to it and uh that's a low tuning yeah it's very low tuning and i think that adds the element of it but uh that's like a shotgun right it's not like it's not a pistol it's not a quick little guitar it's just this heavy low just (laughs) <laughs> I was going to ask listening, you know, with a background in audio engineering with good studio headphones, I'm listening to the album and it's like, I, I it doesn't, there's no bass isn't missing, but I'm not sure if there's a bass or not recorded. So can you clarify, is there like a bass player through the EP or is it that you're covering those frequencies with your baritone guitar? There's there's a combination of a lot of things. The the baritone um, octave pedals, and uh, we did we did put root notes of bass down just to uh, fill out the EQ spectrum. Yeah, and just to have the option for mixing. So it was up to Ratsy. It's like this is what we want to achieve, sort of thing. And then Ratsy would just kind of be like, like that's his world. So we did we wanted to give him the option. Being like, you know, if we if we with all the octaves and the baritone and stuff, if, if it's still missing, that we could put a little bit of this in there too, because it's like when we when we were playing the songs, and when you're in the room, you feel all that stuff. But if like in recording, it's such a different beast. So it's like you, we want to the listener to have the same experiences us in a room with this like all the octaves the baritone and all that stuff and all that big sound um so we did we put root notes on stuff but uh not always there like it's like a little bit here and there just to fill it out to like sort of like give it a little body and stuff in sections that it didn't have but uh that's that's just 
the recording process, I guess, when you just, you just kind of like have to try to do whatever you can to try to make it uh, as close as possible to the way it sounds in the room when you're jamming on real stuff. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned Metallica's St. Anger. And it's so funny you mentioned that because listening to that EP, your vocals in certain points, I got a James Hetfield um, vibe when it comes to how the vocals were mixed. So I, I found that on the EP versus Badlands, your vocals were more raw, kind of more, more dry, kind of piercing through. They sound great. It's not, um, it's not a detriment. It's just describing the sound versus Badlands. The vocals are, are, are warmer. There's reverb, there's delays. And I'm just curious, mm -hmm. was that a conscious choice to have that style mixing the vocals versus the EP and then the album after? That was definitely a change in mixer because what we yeah. did that that was eddie spear so we went down to nashville specifically for, for yeah. that sound because this was a more um yeah sorry for badlands because it was more of that western vibe and that um that hill country blues kind of side of things and he he was just at the cutting edge of a lot of the records we were listening to at the time and um he brought mm -hmm. about a lot of like he wasn't using a lot of the newer uh, processing effects and stuff. He brought all the hard equipment out. So mm -hmm. he had like this crazy delay from like Abbey Road Studios. Like he brought it in a suitcase when he came over from England. And like he he was just using all those cool like candy yeah, it, effects that like we loved on those, those records. So and from the Devil's Porch, like that when we... Ratsy, he mixed so many albums that we loved. Like the the stuff that we um when we went to Ratsy, like we were really into uh the big rec stuff that was happening at the time too, and Monster Truck, and like we just loved the way that that was just so heavy and so present. Punchy. Punchy and and like so we like we were like, this is this is us like this is exactly the guy that we need to use because he's he's hitting all of the elements that we love but it's all the elements that we are um naturally creating when we're jamming like it's like this heavy sound heavy guitars heavy drums all that stuff and uh so the vocal it was he he, he i think he just had a really good handle on our sound and what we were going for so he really knew how to bring forward that sort of like piercing, a little bit of aggressive vocal sound. And that's what the, the album needed to be because it was, we were doing things, uh, we were writing such heavy riffs and, and heavy music and the themes were heavy and like, it was just like, we needed to cut. So Ratsy mixing, uh, he, was, he was making it cut through more where Badlands is just a little bit of a step back it's more of this kind of like throwback sound um, and sort of a throwback journey, whereas from the Devil's Porch is just more present and cutting. Um, There's definitely but, an evolution between the two. Yeah. 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 And it was and, also our first time pressing vinyl too, and we wanted to complement that too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, when you hear Badlands on a, a vinyl, it's that's the way to listen to it, really. it's That's the way we were kind of the whole process of making it was just like, this is the, how it needs to be heard. Um, because of the way that the vinyl breathes, you can hear the depth of the recording. And um, and it's just kind of, that's that's the journey we were on at the time. You know, and, and it is an evolution. And I think that we're fortunate to be able to do that as artists, is take these different chances and go down these rabbit holes and stuff, you know? Like to me, though, the, the those are the bands that we love the most that make albums that are that isn't just the one trick pony every single time it's just like boring <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> show me that you're that you have some depth to you please <laughs> like i don't want to know that you like you know like that you eat the same sandwich every day <laughs> <laughs> So R Renee, I want to know how much fun is it to play the song Pay No Mind live with the, the cool drum fills after the chorus? 
Oh man, we actually have not played that one live in a long time. Uh, oh, in a lot of that you're gonna say never. I was gonna say how dare you, but not. Uh, <laughs> Can it be expected? Moment. Can it be expected on the upcoming tour? Um, I guess you're our, you're opening, so focus... you have a you have a shorter set, perhaps. You know? Yeah, and that's hard too, right? Like. I remember with I Mother Earth and Our Lady Peace, that tour, we were given, what, 20 minutes? I was like, that's four songs. That's hard. Like, how do yeah. you pick four songs out of the catalog of, like, four albums? But And you have um, to play Orleans, you know? So. Yeah, so you have to play we the We played it four singles. times. We, play- <laughs> <laughs> we gave the people what they wanted. <laughs> yeah. We have time for one song and one song only, four times. Yeah. Here you go. So it is going to depend on the set. I know we're going to be doing some headlining shows this year. So we have more of an opportunity to bring back mm-hmm. some of the other stuff. But I think our pride and joy right now is really showcasing what we just did. So mm-hmm. I That's, think it's yeah. the evolution of where we're going and we're really proud of it. And we're really excited to show people it. So mm-hmm. I think uh, the focus will be on new material, but that being said, with a longer set, we do have the opportunity to bring back some, some classics. Yeah, I, I agree that we're just so excited about the new stuff. And that's just kind of where we're at. Like we, you know, bringing, bringing the old stuff, older stuff back. Um, it's it, looking at a set list. It's like, you, we have the opportunity to, um, only do so much. So if, if we have the opportunity to only do so much, if we put this song in, then we have to take that song out. And it's like, and it's kind of like this relationship like that. And uh, what we really want everybody to hear is all the, the, what we, what we just did, because it was such a, um, we dove in so deeply on this new album that we like it's we truly feel this is like the greatest thing we've we've done to date and we really want to share every single song with everybody and it's like it's the whole record yeah and if we <laughs> if we take one out then we gotta if we put that one in then we gotta take this one out but we we want to share that feeling with everybody and uh and but like but it, is said, it is a balance it is a balance because obviously yeah. you want to appeal to your early fans too right so yeah. we're not gonna completely know. we just want to do we want to do all of it for everybody yeah. all the time but we only have so much time <laughs> yeah, but, I, uh, uh, i've had so your upcoming tour uh, you guys are opening for is it Saint Asonia? Saint Asonia? How do you pronounce it? Saint Asonia. Asonia? Potato, so, potato. So I say Saint Asonia, and then I, I heard a friend say the name, and it, and they said something different. I thought, oh man, maybe I've been saying it wrong. But Nirvana, so, Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So I I've had so the Ottawa date for your your tour is May seventeenth. So I'm a fan of you guys. I'm a fan of them. Uh, the first album I got into that I really loved when I was 16 was Stained uh, Break the Cycle. This is back in 2001. So them having the guitarist, Mike Mushock from, from Stained, like that's like a hero of mine as a guitarist. So I've had, I've had your show on my calendar. And then listen to what the universe just did to me. So back during the pandemic, I had tickets to a massive uh, metal show in Montreal. So Megadeth, Lamb of God, Trivium, Hatebreed, and they've been rescheduling the whole pandemic and they just rescheduled it for May 17th in Montreal. I know. So I know. the, the Toronto d- date is the exact same thing. They're also in Toronto when we're in Toronto. Yeah. So, yeah. So the universe just did that to me right now. You're seeing, cause it's like the floodgates have opened, right? So every mm-hmm. band is touring right now or announcing tours. So there we're coming to this crazy time where there's going to be so much overlap where you have options what to do on a Saturday night not yeah. just oh so and so is playing here so it's actually kind of a cool time to be out there and touring right now because mm-hmm. everybody is and the excitement is back the buzz is back and mm-hmm. live music is back so we yeah, will we'll definitely be-, be out there a lot yeah the the uh, the main the main source of income for for musicians is is touring it's ticket sales so you know everyone 
everyone's been hurting financially in the entertainment industry for the last two years during the pandemic. And now that kind of everything, the, the restrictions in Ontario, at least in, in Canada are, are really lifting and yeah, everybody's hit like bands that haven't toured in like 20 years are now touring again. It's, it's like, there's this huge demand for live music, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're going to see a lot of bands come out of retirement, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe not for the better. <laughs> That's true. Hey, no. I, I got, uh, they announced Rage Against the Machine at Blues Fest in Ottawa. So I got a full pass for Blues Fest. And uh, you, you mentioned Tom Morello being, uh, being one, one yeah, of your influences. Yeah. I, he's, he's so like, creative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we hope I, to go to that show too. Uh, well, Toronto, it's, it's hard as you know we're such big fans of music but we're at the point in our careers now where we just can't buy tickets anymore because every time we have to sell them because we have a show or we have a tour right so yeah we, mm-hmm. we just kind of play it last minute but that's that's definitely one of the shows on our radar mm-hmm. renee i was to at o- to open go for. ahead <laughs> to open for yeah yeah hey if you could just play with all these bands and right and it works out yeah, yeah. There, yeah. there is a, as much as we love going to shows, it's playing the shows is, is a completely different rush. Oh yeah. So Renee, I was, I was asking you about uh, the drum fills on uh, pay no mind. So I actually have a comment sent in here from a, a fellow drummer. So this is from Mark Homer, who is the drummer for James Brown before he passed away and he's been playing for oh. C-Spot run. So Mark Homer says these two beautiful humans are all are all what is right about rock and roll today under the powerful stranglehold their music has on you are two of the nicest pros out there, energetic and raw drumming that makes you move and songs that remind you that rock rules, heavy tones, intelligent writing with creative parts more, please. So that's from Mark Homer. Wow. That's, so cool. that's, a, that's unbelievable. That's Thank amazing. you. That's incredible. This is the best interview we've ever done. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on a poster somewhere. Uh, we'll get people. We'll get some some more people to tune in with that. Uh, so, my my favorite guitar part on the entire EP. So we're about to move over to Badlands. Talk about Badlands, the new album, the new tour. So to wrap up with the EP, um, my favorite guitar part is the guitar solo in Rise of the Fall. That man, mm-hmm. that is so oh. badass. And I guess for all the guitarists that are listening, do you have any advice on how a guitarist can play both the rhythm guitar and the lead guitar at the same time? Is there a trick to this? Um, <laughs> Your cat's answering that question. He said, no, there's yeah. no trick. There's no trick. See, I, don't see know, what's... I, I don't know how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess when you write it you make it where it's possible to I, just, both or I, I, just, I make it impossible for myself and then be like this is not possible and then just try to make it possible <laughs> that's what i do <laughs> so the impossible is possible that's my that's my words that's of advice. wisdom if that's my advice cards, the impossible is possible card. how was was the song orleans kind of the first song from you guys that really got a lot of radio play. Like, I'm curious, what, what was it like hearing your song on radio frequently? What are the emotions, well, the feelings? I Is think, it surreal? Yeah. I think we Carry had, On was the big, we, the we did have one. a few radio singles before that one, but this was the first one that really popped. Um, yeah. There was a crazy moment where we, uh, we had <laughs> this story is just, <laughs> You're going to talk about the shed. I'm going to talk story? about building the shed. Oh God, <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Shed story. Cue up the shed story. This was like a building Ikea furniture moment, but we, um, we had to build the shed. And uh, I remember something went horribly wrong and we put the wrong piece in the wrong place and we had to redo it. And we, this went like way into the night. Like we're working under floodlights and then it's like maximum three hours. We're like seven hours yeah. deep. We're angry. We're frustrated. We're tired. And we're like, you know what? Let's just go out for a beer. I'm exhausted. We finished this thing. Let's go out for a beer. And then when we went out for a beer and we sat at the bar and our song came on and we're just kind of laughing and, and listening and drinking. And then, then it's like, people in the bar is singing the song yeah. and they don't even know who we are. Cause at that point our, 
our imagery hadn't really been anywhere. I don't, we didn't even have management at the time. And it's just, I didn't even know if we had an agent. Yeah, like maybe we, just, <laughs> we had a record label was, that was just like, this fucking kicks ass and let's put it out there. And then, and then we just had it out there. We're yeah. sitting in a bar. We're like, it was a surreal moment. Singing the song. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was the it was, shed building day. Yeah. It was, was pretty cool incredible, moment. but uh, I guess that's the nature of it. If you just try to do something really great, it's going to, people are going to recognize the, the, um, the effort of it at least, but uh, also if it is, it is something really great, people are going to enjoy it. So that was, that was a really awesome moment to just be sitting there and be like, they have no idea that we wrote this. (laughs) (laughs) I've seen videos where there's, you know, there's, there's a band that's playing on a patio and they're doing a cover song and then the actual artist walks by. So it's like, it's in LA and, and, you know, the band lit, uh, you know, my own worst enemy and they had a bunch of huge songs. Um, you make me complete whatever all those yeah. songs. So it's like the band is walking by outside and inside they hear their hit being played and they like hop the fence and go up and go on stage and the, the guy like turns and the real band's there and they get up and they jam and you see those videos. So it's, it's, it's funny. It's kind of like that where you're there and people are singing. They have no idea that, that the, they're, you know, they're in the company of, of, of royalty. They have no idea. I don't know if I'd call it royalty. <laughs> I was going to say greatness, greatness, royalty, at least of the creators of the song. Anyways, uh, but they, yeah, it, 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 it is a funny thing. It's like a, the dynamic because we're, we're, we're all, I mean, every artist is a fan first, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's being on the other side of it is different. It's funny, but I think that we, what we try to do is just, always maintain maintain to be humble about it and feel grateful that we have the opportunity to do what we do because we're we're fans first and artists second and i think that uh, we've i don't like i've met artists where it's just like they've lost that perspective and it's like ah oh, this guy's a real piece of shit <laughs> You know, and feel sucks. entitled, and that sucks. It's like you know, just be you. You don't have to be a piece of shit because you think you're better than everybody else. Like you know, and that sucks. Like I don't. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't I don't ever want to be that guy because that's just not me. But it's mm-hmm. also like it's like you're not. We do what we do because we're we're lucky to be able to have the opportunity to do it. And that's the most important thing to never lose sight of. And, and I think that uh, that's why when we, we meet fans and stuff, like we're just grateful that they, they like what we do because it gives us the opportunity to, to do it more. Yeah. And we all started at open mics and in the garage, you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. no hiding the fact that you, you once sucked pretty bad. Yeah. And so artists may, may never go back to that. And some artists may realize that I will never go back to that, but it doesn't mean you have to lose your perspective, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, and still just be a decent human being and, and know that you you were a fan first. And I think that that's, um, I, the, the people that we meet that are on the highest levels of the music industry, they, uh, so many of them have that perspective and stay humble like that and aren't pretending to be something else and I think that there's a lot of artists that do try to pretend to be something else that they're not and um and to me it's just like it's so phony and it's just like makes you want to puke <laughs> like it's like but uh um for us it's just that it, it's just us I guess as as people that we we're always just going to be fans first we always grab tickets for shows and want to go out there and stuff. And I think that that's, that, that's what fuels the organic music that we make and the art that we try to pursue and the songs that we try to write are coming from an honest place. And I think that that's the most, those songs are the, always that you are the greatest songs that can be put out there because it's a real deep connection, you're putting your heart out there, you're putting your soul out there. And that connection is, 
is happening to many different people and to share that moment on the stage live is something that uh, it's just, it's a real, that's, that's life. That's true living as an artist, you know, otherwise you're just faking it. If you're faking it, get off the stage. (laughs) (laughs) People know when you're faking it, right. They can, they can feel the, the congruency and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope so. So in, in 2019, you guys released your full length album, Badlands. Did you feel pressure to follow up the success of the EP and the hit single Orleans? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's be, let's be honest here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Like it's, I mean, cause we, it wasn't like a, it wasn't a formula, you know, I, I, there's bands that have formulas that they'll be like, this is how we do it. And it's just like a, it's like you have this blueprint of this formula of how to do everything. And those bands are, are right. Rewriting the same song every single time. And it's like, that's the one trick pony. We're not the one trick pony. We don't have well, not this necessarily. specific formula that we're following for every single song. Yeah, that, that album was a bit chaotic, right? And a bit all over the place. So how do you recreate that <laughs> if you can't? Yeah. So don't, I guess we just didn't try to recreate it. We just kind of, we knew that we did it on our own. So if we can just make that magic happen again, as we always have, we always, it's always kind of not this, not to say it's the same thing every time, but our mentality going into the record is the same every time. Which you know? is like, like we wrote these riff songs and, you know, we made the songs the best they could be. So let's just keep that consistent. Keep writing the best songs you can write. Yeah. So I, we just stuck with that. Like why um, try and change that up, I guess, except that we want to make the songs better. So I think that's what we changed on that record, right? Like we yeah. looked at the writing of the songs a little more and as much, we've always been very riff driven, right? Like that's where our music started. Lyrics were always kind of written later, always mm-hmm. began with the music and us in a room and just jamming and like hit and mm-hmm. record when, Oh, I really like that. Do that again. Let's do that again. And that's kind of always where our songs always started. So this one, mm-hmm was that too but we honed in more on songwriting and crafting the songs to be um better (laughs) yeah so it's like it's like what we what we learned from the process of from the devil's porch Mm -hmm. we took all of that and brought it into the process of badlands but we also pushed ourselves more and i think that that's what we that's the nature of trying to always improve and write better songs it's like know what worked and then push yourself more on different elements of it and try um, to um, challenge yourself in different ways that you haven't challenged yourself on the last recording. And uh, I think that like when we look at songwriting, like this song is number one, the song rules all like that's, that's our mentality. You know, like we don't, we don't need to sit there and jam for, 45 minutes and just rip like for us it's just like we love the the having this perfect balance of the time that we that we're using and and not writing like 12 minutes of just you know whatever like it's maybe one day we'll write a 12 minute song that will be the greatest thing ever but <laughs> for us for us yeah, yeah. <laughs> But for us, it's just your own like, November yeah. rain someday. You'll... Yeah. I mean, like there, there are songs out there that, that are really, really phenomenal that are long, but um, you know, for us, it's just, uh, if it does, if we reach two and a half minutes and it's like, we're trying to push something more into that because it's only two and a half minutes. It's like, no, it's wrong. Yeah, so it's so like, we definitely had those ones like, uh, the song's only three yeah, minutes. Yeah. Like, um, this is only, yeah. Like, it's like, like well, it feels we, done. Yeah. It feels finished. So it's not, it's, it, but we, we look at the, the, um, songs that we love and most of them sit around like three, three minutes. Like it could be four minutes, could be two and a half or whatever it is. And, and that's kind of the way that we look at songwriting is like, it's usually within this pocket, but organically we're just writing that way. So from the devil's porch, we took everything that we learned badlands. We pushed ourselves in a lot of different ways to, to um, challenge ourselves. Um, because I think that if we didn't do that, then we don't belong. Um, 
you know, touring internationally or <laughs> releasing something or maybe not belong, but maybe we don't, um, and we're not putting our, the, the best version of us and we're not progressing and we're not growing. And yeah. I, I don't think that, you know, if we're not progressing and we're not growing, then we're not true artists at, the, at like trying to work at the craft of it. And then it's just become stale. So we never, we never want to do that. We always want to progress. We always want to grow. We always want to challenge ourselves. So with every single release that we do and every single song that we write, we're trying to do that. We, we, you know, like that's the, that's the goal. So the album, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, al the new album, the, with the new one shockwave, which we're about to release uh, sometime this year is a reflection of all of that. Everything that we've learned from, from the devil's porch and badlands and all that stuff, we're bringing the next evolution of us forward in this new album which is for, why we want to play all the songs live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So Badlands kicks off with the song Wild. It's a great album opener, you know, very energetic, mm -hmm. more awesome guitar riffs. So Johnny, I'm curious, do you have like an app on your phone or a hard drive on your computer that they're just filled with these guitar riffs, you know, that you can just pluck out whenever you're writing a new song? Or is it just, you know, hey, we're gonna gonna work on a new album and then stuff comes out? Um, I have a phone, uh, I, it's funny, like, I just, like, I switched phones recently, and I noticed on my old phone, I had, like, over 6,000 or something recordings of just, like, noodling stuff, and, uh, that was over a period of a couple years, and, uh, and, yeah, I mean, like, there's, there's all that stuff, I try not to go into all those things because like it's it's sometimes it's a painful process of listening to all that stuff and like going through all those riffs and stuff and and uh but I think doing all that and recording all that stuff and having that stuff there is is important to have if you get writer's block and just remember kind of like it brings you back to where like you were at that moment and then I try to capture that and try to write something new how hard is it to actually go back and find a very specific riff you wrote oh. though? <laughs> like yeah. man i remember i wrote something like i don't know a couple Usually, months ago and now you're yeah. like going through all the hundreds i think <laughs> no nope, not that one no not that one no not that one i think when it's i think the the thousands of song recordings are just a reflection of thousands of failed attempts <laughs> you know what i mean because when it's a good when it's really really good I don't care what's going on in my life. That is the most important thing and leave me alone because I need to finish this. <laughs> but so, I don't know, like it's, it's a, uh, that's the creative process, but yeah, there, I have tons of notes that I think more than the riff stuff that I go back to is the lyric stuff. So yeah. I'll make notes about certain lyric things and, uh, or certain lyric ideas and, uh, songwriting ideas and I have tons of notes like on my phone or like wherever and uh, I pull from that more often than the guitar stuff um, but we do we have tons of recordings of us just jamming and and uh, different things like that and yeah do do come back to that stuff and like it is an important part of the writing process. Yeah, I think do you, it's just. Do you both write lyrics, or is it, it Johnny that writes for, for himself? Johnny? Johnny does the majority of the writing. Yeah, I. It wasn't until this album, this last album that we just recorded, that I actually contributed a little bit. But that's because we, there was the three of us in a room and all together working out the lyrics, mm -hmm. right? And it was like you know maybe this word could be better or something like that. And that's when that's when I would come in and we would all brainstorm together on what that word might be. Mm -hmm. I think that we, we, we tried something different. Like, so like I would have a lot of these lyrics and stuff and the, these ideas um, there, but uh, this, for this new album that we have, that we're going to release, um, it was uh, opening up to when we were working with Neil Sanderson, he, he, he's so, talented and he has such a great perspective on uh on storytelling and songs and stuff and we really wanted to um 
let him be a part of our music that way. So we opened ourselves up to like, what do you think about this lyric? And like, so, and then just instead of, you know, like get letting or letting egos get in the way, we really listened to him. And then at that same time, Renee just showed her a, a different side of her and being like, I kind of have this lyric. And then be like, I was Neil telling you good lyrics all along. <laughs> Neil, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Neil and I just be like, whoa, just like that's it. huge. But I think she was just shy, you know, like, so this is, it was, it's, it's great now that's just, she's always been shy though. She never, she used to play drums to, uh, to the wall, to the wall, back to the door. <laughs> it's like, don't look at me. You have a lot more to offer. Like just, oh, thanks. but, uh, oh, thanks. That's so the, the process changes, I guess, like when you start to open yourself up to, um, the talents of everybody else, but I guess coming and to learning the, something new too. Right? Yeah. And then come, but coming to the table is usually me with all this stuff and being like, what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> and then um, adding different perspectives and, and kind of recognizing when it works and when it doesn't work. I and it's think cool it's, when you make something better too. Right. Or that's that it's that aha moment. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. So that's perfect. That's exactly what this needed. Yeah. So I've, I have two, two kind of rapid fire questions about Badlands and then we can move on to the new album. Is that all good? Yeah, sure. sure. All right. So they're kind of, kind of more technical on the instru instrument side. So um, for living too fast. So that's one of my favorites for the, the hook in the chorus, the, so the living too fast, the wee, wee, is that, is that keys? Is that a guitar? Is that back of vocals? What's making that little hook after the living too Vocal. fast? That is vocal? No, this is not, yes. <laughs> Do that one more time. I was talking. <laughs> That's it. I thought maybe it's like a, a sliding guitar, maybe it's I think, vocals. I wasn't I think sure. That, I think that you did that. That too. might have been me too. I think we layered I I, we remember. layered multiple. Oh, it was me. It was me. It was me. <laughs> Renee, we're hearing all the contributions that people are taking for granted. They're coming out in yeah. this interview, all the stuff yeah. that you do with this band. I forgot. I forgot I was part of that. Yeah, there was some background vocals for me on that record. Yeah. Well, it was such like building that record was there's it's such a process of doing so many things. It's like going into it. We have um, we don't want it to take 10 years. So when we get in there, we're just throwing so much at the wall and doing so many different things and changing different recordings and all that stuff. Sometimes we do lose track of like, what, how do we do that again? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. We should have, we sh to be honest, we should have filmed more. Cause I, you're bringing up all these things that I've just completely forgotten about. And there's probably no video history of anything, but that's what interviews are for. That's what this is for. We're bringing, yo, we're bringing back the, <laughs> we're getting you in the fields. We're bringing back all these, me the repressed memories and, and, you know, hopefully it's, it gets you excited to, to, to keep playing, get back out on the road. And, and I, I guess the new album's done. I was going to say to, to keep you excited while you do the new album, but we'll talk about that in a second. My last question, this is for you, uh, Renee. So for the song Red Skies, I'm curious, is it, is your snare off until later on when it gets heavy? It sounds like a Tom a little bit. It is. Yeah. The snare's off until the first, uh, course hits. Yeah. Okay. Which was funny live because that it's a split second to turn it back on. <laughs> no, is it the first or is it the ending that we turn it? Oh back yeah. On? Sorry. It goes all the way to the ending. Cause it's quite the builder. Once right? it gets heavy. Yeah. Once that big. Suddenly you hear like a oh, snare okay. snare. Yeah. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. You nailed it. <laughs> See, I actually to not make a fool of myself. I reached out to a drummer and said, what is the technical term for when the snare sounds like a Tom? And they said snare off. I was going to say something stupid, something else. So what, what was it? What was the, <laughs> what was snare I going to say? Yeah. So he said it's, he's, he calls it snare, the snare, snare off when it's not tightened and it sounds like a Tom. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I was going to say. It was going to be something really stupid. So anyways, <laughs> I'll let you know if I remember, but I definitely erased that from my notes. Um, so we have, we have a comment sent in. This is from a Canadian super group. This is uh, Amir Epstein from Crash Karma. So that's a super group 
you know, for our listeners that aren't familiar, composed of members of IME and Our Lady Peace and uh, some great bands. I think maybe the Tea Party, I got to double check for some of the members. But uh, Amir says, Johnny and Renee are two of the hardest working musicians in Canada, hands down. They've been hustling for almost 15 years. They're still busting their balls. I don't know if Renee's busting her balls, but uh, to make their dreams happen. Most bands would have given up long ago. They have a deep passion for their music. They have each other to keep the dream alive. Their stamina and drive are unmatched. And for that alone, they have my utmost respect. So what I keep, what keeps coming across is that you're great people. You make awesome music, but also your work ethic. So where does that work ethic come from? Oh, I don't know. I just think, I just kind of well, you know what it was? moment there from Amir's comment. Yeah, that's, that's just unreal. Yeah, that's very nice of him. Um, I think because early on in our career, up until the point where we got signed and actually even a little bit beyond that, um, we did everything ourselves, right? So if you wanted something to happen, you had to do it yourself. So like at one point I was radio tracking. So, which basically means I was the one delivering the song to radio and calling them every week. You'd be like, have you heard the song yet? Have you heard the song? (laughs) But you develop a lot of relationships when you do that stuff, right? So it's all part of networking and working hard because nothing comes easy. And I mean, if it did come easy, you should probably question that. (laughs) <laughs> a yeah. little bit. or if it did come easy it's probably because your parents have a lot of money oh yeah there might yeah. Be, yeah and then there was that too yeah. like, we didn't we don't come from money, money. we don't come um, from that we're not like so these. it is about working hard and yeah. making those things happen because you are your biggest fan right so i think it's really important and we still continue to i mean i more than ever actually i spend like five hours a day on band stuff and logistics so even when we're not touring and that's pretty insane now so, I mean, at some point it's going to have to give and I'm going to have to hire someone to do other things, even though, I mean, we have a full spectrum team now too. So, and it's still that busy, mm-hmm. but I, I love it. You know, I actually find it hard to let go of things. <laughs> yeah. I and- still like keep tabs on things. Like, even though we don't do radio anymore, but I'm still every day like, Hey, you know, how's it going? Have you heard from, you know, Brad Gibb at FM 96? Like, yeah. cause I had built those relationships and it's hard to step back from that. Um, I don't think that we want to like I think that it's just it's not even a question of like giving up uh, something or you know I don't know other bands just stop for a lot of different reasons but for us like we do what we love to do so um, having the drive and everything else is is we just don't think about it like we just enjoy what we do so much that we just continue to do it and uh, we're, we're always being uh, in a position that we get to continue to do it to a certain degree. Like it's like, you know, it's um, the music industry has changed uh, so much from when we first got a record deal, like our, our label alone, I don't know how many times it's changed over four or five times. And like, they're always like, we want you guys to stay with us. We It's like this core team that is so, slowly they're, just they're merging evolving. they're selling they're buying yeah and then it's like a, a, we we every time it's like merging or selling or buying it was just like are we gonna have a record label because we're seeing like all these other bands get dropped and it's just like no but they just they want to bring us along and they still want to invest in our recordings and and invest in us as artists and stuff and so we're very lucky to have that and i think that we keep uh we keep that in the forefront, you know, like we just, we know that we're fortunate to be able to do what we, what we love to do. And um, so we just continue to do it. And uh, And it's kind of all we know, right? Like our life is music. We live and breathe music. So, I mean, even if the day ever came where we didn't have a label or an agent or manager, we would still be doing it. Like, even Mm -hmm. if it was for ourselves and, you know, just to express ourselves through music, I think it'll always be there. Yeah, so. I think that uh, there's uh, the the line gets um, a little messed up when it comes to uh, business and what it's all about. You know, like it's I think that a lot of bands fold and stuff because they need to pursue something else to make money to 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 pursue a different living and they have a different perspective on what they want. And it's like, they, 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 are they in it for the craft? Are they in it for 
um, the art of it and and creating or, or are they in it for like is money and making as much money as possible more important to them then they're going to go into a different industry at the time because it's you know like i think that well life is different for different people too like people have families you know when you have mm -hmm. a kid you have to start to reevaluate um what you need to do to you know mm -hmm. raise that kid right so we do we don't have children so i mean we kind of do <laughs> but... where is he where is he where do you go <laughs> but so we are our, what we need out of life to make money is a little different than what other people might need. Right. So. Mm -hmm. I know the only reason why I bring that up is just that the, you know, the industry isn't what it was a long time ago, but this is, those are the reasons we see a lot of bands stop is because they're not um, able to maintain or sustain a living. And we've been able to, because I, I we're, we're lucky that um, we have, uh, we're able to go out and perform and do shows and like create albums and have the support that we do with fans and stuff. And we're always going to be forever grateful for that. And I think that if we're not grateful, that's probably when you're going to lose your drive to create. And uh, we always maintain that grateful and humble feeling to be able to do what we love to do. And I mean, we get to rock on stage. Yeah, we get to we get to be a fucking it's pretty rock sweet band. living. That's yeah. so hard. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you can't take it too seriously, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we, we, you know, do, in the path that we're on and we get to meet incredible people and we're very, you know, we, we're very social people and the the amount of different people that we get to meet and the, the like coming from so many different places, we get to um, have that as being a bonus of, of uh, being a rock band is how many more creative people we get to enjoy the company of and and how, that's like that alone is just such a huge bonus of being able to be a rock band and travel and stuff is meeting cre other creative people is so such an amazing uh experience mm -hmm. <laughs> so and it, it brings out the fan of us again you know which is the root of where it all starts being a fan first. Well, speaking of fans, we have a fan question. So this comes in from Selge Menard. He says, one thing I remember was, and so we've seen you guys live and he says, one thing I remember was how they were very passionate about some charity work. I can't remember which one, but I assume they do lots or are advocates for some charities. Can you ask them to talk a little bit about their favorite charities? So that's from Selge Menard. Yeah, I mean, when we're given a platform like an arena stage, it's a good opportunity to branch out and do some good in this world, right? So um, I believe it began with World Vision. Mm -hmm. I want to say that's where it's actually was Sea Shepherd before that. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's ongoing. <laughs> um, we were very involved with uh, World Vision for a while there. Um, and we still are. We still have our sponsor child. But uh, his brother actually worked on the marketing side and um, connecting musicians and artists with the cause of raising money and sponsorships for children. Um, just, I, it's hard to really get into that because um, we got involved before ever seeing it firsthand. It wasn't until afterwards that we actually got to see it firsthand that kind of changed everything. Um, mm -hmm. It just... You have so much, we have so much privilege here and to actually um, be able to reach out a hand and do some good in other parts of the world where they have so little, um, but actually have so much in terms of love and community. And it's just, it's all for the better of humanity, right? Um, so following World Vision or maybe even pre-World Vision, we also work with Sea Shepherd which is near and dear to my heart because I love the ocean and ocean life. And, uh, you know, I burned through a few copies of free Willie growing up. <laughs> I love whales. So he that's probably... the, that's the charity that I, love... you, I, I believe you feature on your website, right? See, uh, okay. so actually, uh, sea yes. Sea Shepherd is ongoing with us. Uh, we did a campaign with pre saves for Spotify where we redirected marketing dollars to Sea Shepherd, which was really cool and amazing of our label to do that and want to be a part of that. Um, 
Uh, for our official online store, it's Sick Kids uh, in Toronto, which came to us because uh, we had a friend whose child was in Sick Kids for a while, and uh, that really brought about something uh, very close to us, right? Where um, we don't have children, but you know, when you have to live through that experience of someone close to you, and what that that um, organization does for them and their lives, I think that really had a big impact on us and we wanted to also give to that charity. So we we do um, move things around a little bit. I wish we could give to all of them all the time. And I guess there will be a point in our lives where we can, but um, we just kind of pick our moments for certain ones and um, try to share the love and the wealth amongst all of them. So I'm sure as we, you know, start to grow and evolve, we'll be introduced to other charities and more organizations and, you know, continue. Mm -hmm. It's something we're always going to continue to do. You know, this humanitarian stuff is so important. I, I think it comes from just us growing up to seeing other bands do it. And I think that we, you know, when you're a fan of another band and you, it's like, oh, wow, like, look at, like, what, look at what Pearl Jam's doing. Like it's, or look at what Incubus or like. Tea Party is a tea, big like, example. So we just, we see yeah. that stuff and like those, you know, looking at those bands and those people and always kind of having such a respect for them as artists and stuff and seeing that they're doing those sort of things um, really got us interested in doing it ourselves because it's like, wow, well, you ever get the opportunity. It's like, it's such a cool thing to be able to give back. And uh, so I think that that um, that's kind of where why we wanted to do it too. It's like, and we hope that other bands, if they see what we're doing, that they will do it too, yeah. because I think that that's a, a really um, show of character that you're you're not a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> you're really dropping that a lot here just, we really need to emphasize <laughs> stop being a piece of yeah. shit <laughs> yeah that's the one message we're trying to get yeah. across yeah. don't yeah. be a piece of shit don't like, be an I, asshole. I, I commend you guys on on your work with charity and raising awareness and and all that stuff that's that's good to hear um the new album is done it's called shockwave it'll be out at mm. some point in 2022 the new single is out uh pretty little broken thing the new music video just dropped so what can fans expect from this new album more of that <laughs> more of yeah. that single type yeah like yeah. we definitely we went all out to the next level with this record and we had a, you know this pandemic uh brought about a pretty crazy opportunity for us right like we mm -hmm. we had been able to work with neil sanderson on our last record but only with uh wild right we he co-wrote with neil on that song so it was taking mm -hmm. the best of that and bringing it to this new record and it was just such a crazy opportunity because otherwise he would have been on the road right three days grace is touring every mm -hmm. day of the year so this was an opportunity for us to be able to work together and um, be a part of his team too, because his, he has so many contacts, like for mixing, mastering, musicians, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it was a very cool experience. So you, you're going to see a different side of us, but it is still the roots of us having, you know, gotten together and just hit record in a jam space. And we wrote that riff to that beat. And then actually this time more of the songwriting came out of us, right? We really, really honed in on the, the craftsmanship of songwriting. Mm -hmm. So, and it's about, you know, it's about us like, and our, our journey through everything and how we've grown and, you know, the ups and downs and just everything was meant to be in this moment. So I just, I really hope, People love this record as much as we do. I, it was such an awesome time putting it together. Like the, probably the most fun, not to say that anything past wasn't fun, but we literally spent a year working on this record with Neil, which that's an insane amount of time. I, it wasn't every day, but it was like. Every other day. Every other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was the, the songs on this album are just, I, I, you know, like we, Renee makes up a good point, like I was saying, like, we hope that people like it and, and or feel what we put together as much as we do. But I, to be honest, like, I'm not, 
the songs are just are bigger. The songs are better. The, the recording process is, is, is more fine tuned. Like everything about it is on a, a higher level uh, because, and I say higher level, just meaning that we were able to put more time into it and really get into the details a lot more, but also keeping the same mentality of that launched this whole thing, which was Orleans, which is just don't force it. You know, like sometimes simple is the best thing and simplicity. We don't have to overcomplicate it. So it's like gauging what is right for the song and what is what keeps you pumped up and for us and like what where um when it's too much and like pull back on some stuff and like keep things simple or sometimes like let's really overcomplicate this part <laughs> so it's because like, we can and it's fun yeah exactly everything we did was just out of fun like, and we we really wanted to look at like this is let's try to write a three minute song and and uh or not try to write let, let's make this or this feels like a three minute song like how do we fill the rest of this out a certain way within this certain timeline and that's kind of the canvas you know like as an artist it's like this is this is this canvas looks this way and like how do we fill the canvas out of certain to to make it the best picture that it can be the best song it can be and uh and we always push ourselves in that process and we definitely with, did musically yeah and neil or neil what was great about him is that um he's ready to 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 grind and push us even further and we're always up for the challenge so um it was a really great working process with him and That's a really so great true. aspect because a lot of people or not a lot of people like other artists and different bands they don't like to hear that shit like they don't want to be when they start to get pushed they they just like revert back into their own the, themselves and just like fuck this person we like they don't know what they're you know what I mean? yeah but it's like we we handle that very easily you know we don't we do, like we can we can be pushed and we can be like for neil to all to always like push it to the level uh, like wanting more to try harder do this do that and stuff like we could we take that stuff to, and uh we we manage it very easily to be able to come up with something great and uh and sometimes it's like always it, you're gauging whether it's the right move or the wrong move and and the working relationship with neil we would push, push, push. And then sometimes we'd be like, ah, you know what? It's not the right move. Let's try to pull it back a bit. And, you know, like maybe this, the, the original lyric here was the best one. And, uh, and then sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. <laughs> so it's like, it's, uh, it's, it sounds like a painful process, but <laughs> we have a lot of fun going through that process. And uh, so on this new album, it's just a lot we spent a lot more time in the creative zone, uh, uh, which yield, uh, which got us to yield a lot of great material in the past. And uh, so this album, I think is like our Mona Lisa. <laughs> like it's like legit the best thing that we've done and the best songs. And it exposes more of us and our relationship and our, our journey through being a rock band and and being a couple as well going through this whole thing and uh that's what we wanted to bring forward the most it's like um we have the time to really put that album together that reflects us the most and we wanted to use that time to be like this is now it's time it's time to put our mona lisa together our best work our album that tells our story the most and that's what this new album is and we're so excited to to release it to the world yeah. and uh we've had it in our pockets for a little bit now but to the yeah. point like i'm still listening to it by myself and i i 
used to like shame myself about that in the past. <laughs> like really you're listening to your own music, but like, I really enjoy listening to it. I, I love this record. And yeah. I think that's saying something too, right? Like it's a, well, I mean, we would, we would listen to our, obviously our other albums, but this one is just, there's something so addictive about it that is just different than the last recordings. And it's hard to ex explain what that feeling is because the last recordings, we love them so much too. But this one is just, we just put so much soul and heart into it and uh, so much work. And it's such a team effort too with the, like the engineers that we that we worked with and with Neil and um, in the mixing process, like it was, it was on a different level working with a whole new team that we've never worked with before and they're um it's we're very i guess listening to it all the time is just because we're proud of it we're so extremely proud that we did it and you, you know be. we set out to be i think in defense like they say you know no one's gonna love you if you don't love yourself on um, i would say you know who's gonna listen to your music if you don't love your music right uh, that's how exactly. i think about it exactly yeah. and I, I i think that you know like um, the fact that we're having this interview and we have the album done and all that stuff is just a reflection that we accomplished our goals. And, uh, and that's an amazing feeling. Now we're set and more. Yeah. And we're set. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, oh. We finished it. We finished. And now it's like, what's next? Yeah. <laughs> that's why you have to enjoy the journey because when you accomplish 100%. something, if there's, if it's not about the journey of having gotten there, then there's you know, that sadness that kicks in because it's oh, done and, and I don't, you know, I'm still the same person. You, you always yeah. have to have that next goal, uh, you know, to, to strive towards. Um, so yeah. I have to say that the sound quality of pretty little broken thing, like it sounds as good as anything I've, I've ever heard. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how something could sound better than that. Like it's perfectly recorded, perfectly mixed, all that stuff. Like that, that's what a epic rock song, like a rock single, that's what it should sound like. I'm curious, is that the Howard Benson touch? Like someone that's one of the best mixing engineers in the world that's worked with every big rock man on the planet. I yeah, think it's a, I think I mean, it's a combination of a lot of things. Well, it's him and Joe, but and the engineering, yeah, and even the instruments, the amps, the drum kit, like performances as well. Yeah, right? you guys Everything. are getting yeah. better. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the goal ultimately, uh, like sonically, was that this this album has to match what is happening in active rock radio too. Like, it's got to stand up to it sonically as far as the act what you're hearing at the, the, the end product pushing through the speakers of the headphones yeah that's kind of hard to explain to someone <laughs> yeah. who, who doesn't know the background of that stuff but so i mean you go to the best right so we had that connection with howard benson through neil sanderson and you know they're partners in judge and jury records and mm -hmm. i'm so glad that happened because like i can't even tell you like usually we're pretty fussy and we have a lot of revisions and stuff, but with this mix, it was just like, Oh my God, there it is. This is awesome. And mm -hmm. you would listen to it next to, you know, something else on rock radio that you absolutely love. You're like, Oh, it stands up against it. Like, this is so cool, but it's mm -hmm. ours. Right. Like, so I think as a band, there's that really cool moment. It's like when you first hear yourself on vinyl, right. It's like that really cool moment where you're like, Oh, this is what I wanted. Mm -hmm. This is where we wanted to be. It's a reflection of how far we've come. Yeah, I think it's that that you know when it's when something sounds a certain way, it's just that it sounds that way because of all the hard work over the years and like recognizing what it takes to make it sound that way, and recognizing what it takes to write a song a certain way and have a have the music um, feel a certain way. It's like years of hard work, years of of being a band and and recognizing how to piece that together and learning and it's like you learn from the, all these different things and like and you take the best aspects of that you keep building on the best aspects to get to a certain level yeah. but and sometimes I think that's a reflection of it 
but sometimes it's all about chance and having the stars align, right? It was just mm-hmm. in the cosmos that these people happen <laughs> Neil to be deGrasse available. Neil deGrasse Tyson. If you watch Cosmos, <laughs> Neil deGrasse you know exactly Tyson. exactly what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it, it, it comes down to that just being fortunate to be able to work with the people that we work with yeah. to help the process, but also that are just as excited about it as us. And I think that, oh, oh the cat just. No animals were harmed in the making of this podcast. <laughs> I, I, he hasn't come around yet. Um, but you should uh, check on him. Yeah. Anyways, but it, it is a reflection of how, how we've, um, how far we've come in the process, I think. And, and, uh, and um, Neil helped that process but we it was also us like you know knowing what's good for us and what's not good for us and knowing like you know we always try to put egos aside and always try to focus song is number one and we want it to sound the best it can sound and uh being able to um navigate where how to do that i think is one of our best uh uh, best parts about us is we always we're able to navigate a certain way and recognize what the best thing for us is and knowing like um how we can achieve it if we just put ourselves out there to try to do it <laughs> you know and working with neil that was it it was just like you know we could go we could go into the studio we know all these great producers we know all these like great mixers and all this different stuff and it's like we have a budget to be able to do that it's like, what do we want to do? It's like, you know what? Working with Neil, it was like, we work really, really well together. And there's a really great connection. We know that he hasn't produced a full album yet, but the demo stuff that we do sometimes is just so incredible. And it's like, why don't we just see if he's up for it? Why don't we just see if we, we can do an album together? So we put it out there and we're like, would, what do you think about like entertaining the idea of just producing an album with us? Cause what we're doing demo wise sounds incredible. And, you know, we could go to a different producer as somebody we don't know and, and we know what they can do, but, uh, um, we actually this, did. What do you mean? We originally had someone else doing the record, but he wasn't available. Well, that's that was why we ended up. Well, when like, we when we I mean, talked, like, to, when we just happened. When because... we, we originally we were looking at doing something with uh, a different producer. Yes, that's true, uh, but it didn't. Uh, the stars didn't align that way. We got pushed in a different direction, and when we were in that facing um, a different way, that's when we decided to entertain the idea of po- the possibility of Neil taking on the challenge of producing at the same time. But I mean, in the the process that we were going to originally do and working, we probably would have come up with something completely oh, wait different. A minute, but it's just it wouldn't it be works, the same right? album. Totally. No. And we don't know what that, that album would sound like. Isn't that just life though? I don't yeah. know if it would sound as good as this one, but it would have been a hip hop album. We don't know yeah. why. <laughs> Yeah. We don't know why. <laughs> Renee would have been singing. I'm actually playing it was guitar. actually it was actually was Timbaland drums. that you were trying to work with. Yeah, yeah. He just wasn't available. Yeah, yeah. So the but stars, I mean, like looking in the past, looking at the past, and like all the the different directions that we could have gone. I mean, we could dig down to the very first album and what we did. <laughs> like it's just we just kind of go with the flow and ride the wave as it, as as it's happening and be like this is a good idea at the time. This is the best idea at the time. This is the best, like trying to just know what is best for us and the opportunities that we have. So the, the stars aligned with one more person, which is the final comment that I have to share with you. So Chuck Daly from I Mother Earth, originally from the salads, uh, he plays bass on this album and he's actually joining you guys for the tour that's coming up as well. So he sent me like a novel worth of comment (laughs) and I did not edit it. So this is, we're going to wrap up the podcast right after this. And uh, so, you know, hang tight. Here it goes. You ready? You guys ready for some words? 
Okay, Wait, here we go. Was this over text or email? This uh, is by text. Uh, oh, this amazing. is by Facebook Messenger, actually, oh, okay. if we're being technical. So Chuck says, I adore these two. We've known each other for years. We've toured back and forth across Canada together. I've not only spent hours standing, sing along, singing alongside stage, I've also thrown limes at them, limes at them from side stage. Mid-pandemic, I got a call about playing on their newest release. After hearing some music and a call with Neil, I was in. They saved my soul. I've produced and been on a lot of records. There's always a lot of cooks in the kitchen that have ideas for bass players. This was pure freedom. I played some basic shit, and then Johnny and Renee said, play more. Go for it. In the studio, Neil had some thoughts until I started tracking, and then he said the same thing. Just be you. Do your thing. And oh, man, did I ever. It was so damn fun to have the opportunity to decorate these songs while being produced by this team. And the results were so incredibly over the top outstanding. I prayed they might ask me to play with them live one day. We've been jamming at the mothership, a.k.a. my house. Tours coming up. And the other awesome thing is we're all vegan. With IME, there's always an avocado for me. Here, Renee cooks. Johnny <laughs> says he's a chef. Good eating. Great rock and roll. La Buena Vida. Love me some standstills. Chuck Daly. That's, That's hilarious. Funny. They only give him an avocado. I got to yeah. talk to Chris. About I, told, I, I told him, hey, avocados. I said avocados are expensive. So if they're bringing you avocados that... You're kind of a big deal. Vegetarian, vegetarian. I got, we got, we got to eat real cheese. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to give up the cheese. That's, the cheese that's, portion. Uh, that's unbelievable. Chuck. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck was a game changer on this record. And it was a situation where it's like, I think it's, it can be intimidating to go to a studio and put something over top of someone else's music. Right. So but we, none of us were bass players, right? So we were looking for a bass player. Whereas in previous records, it was all about, can you just play to the guitar? Like uh, we wanted yeah, the guitar and the bass to be one. Whereas- I would just throw root notes down or James would throw root yeah. notes down just to have it as a layer for the mixer. But yeah, it's this time around, it was, it was we, um, we wanted to entertain, um, the progression of us in a way that nobody has heard us before. Mm -hmm. So it like, it, we like the idea of like, a lot of these songs are baritones, so which it is like a bass guitar, but how cool would it be? And how cool would it sound if we just had this like, like other bass line that was just there telling a different story in the song. And we haven't done that before. And like, there's, there's certain songs in rock and roll that where it's just like the bass player is putting on a clinic the whole time. Like okay. if you just listen to the bass alone. Kings of Leon like, is a great example. Well, that. I mean, like, yeah, like, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of acts out there that like in the song that the bass player is just doing this sort of other, other element that's not just throwing down the root notes or playing what the guitar is playing or like, little bit of candy here and there it's just like the bass player is doing some job like john uh led zeppelin like he, yeah rush he, you know, the chili peppers they all have yeah them. it's yeah and it's, it's like, like their like, signature right but we've we've you know we've worked with people in the past and and uh or that were great musicians and stuff it just never glued properly with what we were doing and um and this time around i think that like we, I don't think we would have brought Chuck in. Like we enter, we entertained a couple of different people aside from Chuck too. But when, when we got stuff back from Chuck, it was like, holy shit, like, listen to this. Like, this is something like he's, he's being himself, but he's doing things. He, he was putting his own story into the song. And uh, so all we needed to do was just say, do more of that. <laughs> like, you know, like we just need you, like, we're not asking you to do anything other than just be yourself and do what you can do. But we never had the, that, the story of our songs being told from his perspective or from a perspective of a different musician that way in the bass. And then we just love the way how, how much heavier it got, like, because I'm on a baritone 
um, for majority of the stuff, it's just, it's sitting in the base frequencies, but just a little bit above a base. So when you bring the base in, now it's just banging in the low end. It's just so much bigger, so much heavier. And uh, so he added this um, incredible um, story to it, but also just the depth of the low end in such a cool way. We're just like, we got to do this. <laughs> like, and then when we asked them, they're like, dude, you got to, you want to like tour with us? Or like, you <laughs> yeah, know, like, the chemistry yeah. was there, right? And he was like, better to hire than yeah. the guy who did it. And he's he was he's like, so he was dying like, to get out and tour. You have no idea. Yeah. yeah. He's like a, he's like a brother too. Like we've spent time with him on the road when he was playing with I'm Mother Earth. And, and, uh, you know, we, even like when this, this, this process happened like renee was talking with christian and stuff too and she's like we got like we were doing this stuff with chuck and like you know we were we were talking about like touring with them and stuff and christian was like giving us his blessing and like just like yeah it's like go for it guys fucking like he's like a brother to us too so we just it's a very it just felt very natural very cool very kind of like we're excited about bringing showing people us as a as a trio um because it, this is the evolution of it is just so organic and so um it feels very natural and very like this is where we are supposed to be and this is the music we're supposed to be writing with this individual as part of it yeah just feels right yeah it's amazing he's mm -hmm. uh and uh, he's a great, like, he's really easy to hang out with. <laughs> so it's like, that, he's, he's, that a, he's a funny because dude. Because we're going yeah. to spend a lot of time together, you know. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got tickets to the, uh, the Ottawa date for his IME show where it's the mm -hmm. both singers. So that'll yeah. be, that'll be pretty yeah. awesome. So yeah. to, to be respectful of your time, I have one final question. Can you handle one final question? Yeah, sure. Awesome. So if if we could go back in time and you guys could sit down with your 10 year old selves you have cute cute little renee cute little johnny what advice do you pass on to your 10 year old selves mm. hang on to your reebok pumps <laughs> <laughs> That shit's worth that might money be, these that days. That might, might be the best in, in your Pokemon cards. Yeah. Yeah. That shit is worth money. Don't sell your Beanie Babies. Yeah. Inve invest in Tesla. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, right? That's Hey, that, that might be the best advice that any guest has given to their, their younger self. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, guys, look, I, I've had a, a blast sitting down with you guys. It was awesome to connect. Um, you guys gave some, you know, some authentic answers, which I'm sure our listeners appreciate. Uh, I'm loving the new single. I can't wait for the new album. Um, where, where can people connect with you online? So if they want to listen to the music, where to find it, the website, uh, Instagram, if they maybe want to reach out and say, Hey, I loved you guys on the podcast. Uh, where do they go? Where do they find you? I think I think our website is the the, the just, best place because it has yeah. everything. Or just like, Google the standstills. The website yeah. will be the first thing to pop up, and then all our social media. And uh, we fully run our social media at the moment, so it's me. So <laughs> any messages or comments and likes and stuff, I'm seeing directly. So that's probably the easiest way yeah. to reach out to us. And we try to stay connected as much as possible. Um, with the time that we have now like when, whenever we're not on the road when we get onto the road it's it's a little more difficult to keep up with all that stuff yeah and uh or in the studio and whatnot but yeah social media and the website has links to everything that which is the standstills.com yeah I music think. yeah <laughs> videos it's all we're on the interweb inter the, the interweb the interweb the webinet we're on the webinet <laughs> well renee johnny thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it yeah thanks for having us this was thank awesome you. really you're good very, question really good questions you're very welcome so to our fans to our listeners thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode 
I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'd love to hear from you guys. My goal is to grow this podcast organically, where you're giving me feedback on topics you'd like me to cover and guests you'd like me to interview. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J O E L, and on Twitter at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message, and I'll see you on the next episode.